absolutely wonderful that here in the 21st century, we as Christians do not struggle with legalism anymore. That was just a first century thing, right? As, as we're going through this Galatians series, that, that's the kind of stuff that, I, that I'm talking about. That we, that When I say that we all struggle in some ways, and, and often in ways that we don't even notice. It's those things that sometimes we judge people on internally that... Okay, so most of us wouldn't probably say those things out loud, but that's sometimes those thoughts happen in our minds. Sometimes we do actually talk about people that way behind their back, right? Sometimes we treat people a little bit differently because they wear yoga pants or something like that. Sometimes we, we take these things and we may call, we have different names for them, we may call them a, a higher standard or, or whatever it is, and and sometimes that may be the case. It may be that there is actually this higher standard that the Lord has called someone to, or maybe that we're talking about things that are biblical. But when you're not, if, if you say that you're living by a higher standard, what's that saying about the people that don't follow that same standard? It's, it's a lower standard. That's just that's kind of what higher and lower mean. And that's kind of judging people. And there's a good chance that it's legalistic when we're not talking about things that are clear biblical guidelines. We're spending 13 weeks in Galatians. And, and a lot of that book, that letter to the Galatian church is focused on legalism. But it's extremely important. And it, it is worth every bit of the time to talk about this issue because it's not just a first century thing. It's a thing that we still struggle with today. And also because when we're not living the gospel, that turns people away from the gospel. And when we turn people away from the gospel, there are eternal consequences for them. Personally, just, just individually for any of us, not living the gospel, that gets in our way of our relationship with God. The Apostle Paul understood those consequences. He understood that it's, it's even more than what we talk about here, just how important that is. That's why he's so passionate and so thorough in his discussion of, of trying to pull the, these Galatian Christians, these new believers, new-ish believers at this point, away from the Judaizers and the legalists. And today... We're going to see what he thinks should happen, what the church should do about legalism within its ranks. What should the church do when legalists are trying to come in and turn people away from the true gospel? This is a part of kind of getting into Paul's conclusion of his theological defense. He's, he's kind of wrapping up, he's reviewing what he's covered so far and giving even a new perspective on it today. And it's kind of his closing exhortation to his theological defense. But, of course, like any good preacher, just because it's his conclusion doesn't mean that he's anywhere near finished. So, in conclusion, let's pray. No. Let's, let's pray. Father, I do, uh, as, as we come back in here into this book and we're talking about legalism, we know that these are things that we do struggle with, even though we don't always see it. And so I'm asking that you would help us to see it. And for those things that we hide down deep, that we say, no, 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 I'm okay. I, I don't struggle with this. God, I just pray that you would open our hearts to, to reveal to us the ways that we may be oppressing and persecuting others without even knowing it that we may live your gospel, and because we're living your gospel, that others would be drawn into that beautiful, wonder, wonderful, and precious gospel connecting with our Savior. And so may your word ring so true today, Lord. May anything that I say that is not of your truth be, be just quickly forgotten, but may your word resonate in our hearts and change our lives by your Holy Spirit. We ask that in Christ's name. Amen. Right away, we see that at its core legalists, they're naturalists rather than faithful. Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 28. Tell me, this is Paul writing still, of course, tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? And we'll break there for just a second before we continue the rest of it. When Paul is talking about the law here, he's talking about the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Torah, the first five books of our Old Testament. And so that's going to include Genesis. That's what he's talking about with the law. And at this point, the Galatian church is at kind of a, a major transition point in, in their history as a church and in their lives as individuals. Will they turn to and follow the legalists? Will they go back under the law? Or are they going to stay in grace? And from the way that Paul is writing and what we see in history, it seems that they are leaning law, 
even though they haven't gone all the way there yet. And if these Judaizers and legalists sound so convincing and appealing, how do these people actually understand the whole story? If it it seems like they're drawing them in, because Paul is is desperate to stop them, to, to turn the Galatians back to living the gospel, turning them back to grace. And so he challenged them. He said, think of what the law says. These other folks seem so appealing to you. How is that possible if you really know what the law says? And so he continues on, if he's trying to give them the whole story. He says, verse 22, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. By the son of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. Or but the son of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. And the son by the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, rejoice, barren woman who does not bear Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. So kind of a refresher just to get what we're really talking about in in this story, what Paul's writing about. God had promised Abraham and Sarah a son, and this son is the son that is going to carry forth the entire promise that has gone to Abraham. But the thing is, Abraham and Sarah are old, and they're getting older. The Bible even says that she was past her childbearing years. There was no way that of their own they were going to have a child, and so it's taking a while, and isn't it kind of funny, sometimes we... In our perspective, a lot of times it does seem like God is taking a really long time with things. And yet he has a perfect reason for it. And so we are called to trust and to wait. Abraham and Sarah didn't. They took matters into their own hands. And so Abraham took Sarah's slave. Sarah, it was kind of her idea. And he kind of takes her slave, Hagar. And with her, they have Ishmael. And that was a really common practice in that time, that if a woman couldn't have a child, that she would you know, allow one of her servants to go and to, to bear a child for her. But even though it was common, it wasn't faithful. It was a human work. It's something that they did totally on their own that a lot of people can do. And in those days, as Paul's talking about here, this child being born a slave, even though he's born to Abraham, the custom, the tradition, even, even the law at those points, the, the mother's status impacted the status of her children. So Hagar being a slave, her children would be slaves. And so Ishmael, to that extent, was a slave. But God had made a promise. There was that human work that had just happened to bring about Ishmael, but God had made a promise and he kept it. He gave Abraham and Sarah a son. They named him Isaac. And he was born free through Sarah by promise. It was miraculous. There was no chance of that happening apart from God's intervention. There was no chance of them having Isaac, of this promise being fulfilled, apart from God's promise, apart from God working on their behalf. Do you see how this plays in a little bit to our discussion on legalism? I'm laying it on kind of thick there. So that's kind of the historical, the the physical end of it. But then Paul says, well, there's actually kind of an allegorical meaning to this as well. Paul likes analogies. They help us to understand things. It's a story that people were familiar with. And so when he says this is allegorical, we do want to be careful because it doesn't mean that everything in the Bible has some kind of deeper meaning, like the allegorical meaning that we might come up with matters more than the, the historical that we actually see. But in this case, this is the Holy Spirit writing through Paul. And if the Holy Spirit says this is what it means, this is what it means. And so there is something here that you can take this analogy, and that's where Paul's going at this point. So he compares those two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, to the conflict, the situation between Judaism and Christianity. And he says there's two different covenants that are happening here. You've got the Mosaic Covenant. That's the one at Mount Sinai. It goes back to Mount Sinai where Charlton Heston received the law. I was wondering if people would catch that. Do any of you, like, every time you think of Moses, you, you picture Charlton Heston? For my youth up here, do you guys pr- picture Christian Bale? Have any of you even seen the new Exodus movie? Okay. It's probably a good thing, because then you're thinking of Batman every time you think of Moses, and that's just really weird, too. So, 
Yeah, media has this weird kind of way that it plays into our heads, right? So anyway, what we're getting into here, Paul's comparing these two sons. And so he goes back to this Mosaic covenant and, and says that Mount Sinai is like Hagar, that both Mount Sinai and Hagar, they have produced slaves. And so people who are living under the law are slaves to the law, just like Ishmael. But the physical Jerusalem at that point in history, we're talking first century here, they're in slavery. They're in slavery to the law, and to a degree, they're even in slavery under Rome. And so you can claim physical descent from Abraham all you want. Great. So you were his physical descendants. But that just leads to slavery based in works. The law system, the legal system, that is, that's about human effort. It's about works. It's about the natural means. It's about what can I accomplish on my own? How can I take care of this? The Abrahamic covenant goes back further. It goes back to the promise to Abraham, natural means versus promise. And so Christians who are Abraham's spiritual children are free, like Isaac. Christian Jerusalem, which is what Paul talks about when he talks about the Jerusalem above, and it's above that one day is coming back down here, that one is free. It's free from the law. It's free from the penalty of the law. It's based in God's promise. It is not based in our works. It's a fulfillment of Isaiah 54.1 that Paul has quoted here, that Israel had become barren when she was in captivity at that point in Babylon, but in Christ even those who are faithful in Israel are freed. And all of us as Christians, we become freed and fruitful. And the ultimate fulfillment of that passage is in Christ's millennial reign, when Israel has turned back to him. And this Christian system now, it's all about miraculous means. It's what God does on our behalf. It's what God has already done, and it's what God's going to be doing going forward. It's not, it's not about our efforts. At the core, legalism, works righteousness, that's about what I can do. It's about my own works. It says that I am capable of meeting God's standard, which really just lowers God's standard. But the gospel, Christianity, living that out, that's about what God does. It's about recognizing that we are flawed, that we are incapable, and that we need something outside of ourselves because we cannot be equal to God which is the constant human experience of trying to somehow make ourselves equal with God. And it's recognizing we can't do that. Legalistic laws and rules and standards, those are marks of slavery. They are not marks of freedom. They are marks of weakness. And yes, God does give us commands, right? I mean, we look in Scripture, we see God has told us things that we should do, ways that that we should live, and we obey those by faith because we trust Him and because we love Him. But we only trust Him and love Him because we have the Holy Spirit. That's not a thing that's our efforts. It's because the Holy Spirit is in us. 1 John 4, 19, we love because He first loved us. God allows us to love Him. Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons, we covered this a couple weeks ago, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so these good works, this obedience that we do is the Holy Spirit that enables us to do that, crying out for our Father and desiring him. And so we can only truly obey and do good works by the power of the Holy Spirit. And those works, those obedience things that we do, those things do please God. But when we use works to earn favor or to put ourselves above others or we use works in any kind of selfish way, that's what Paul later talks about as filthy rags, when our works just become like filthy rags. When our spiritual growth and our obedience are driven by faith, it pleases God. But when they're natural and just things that we are doing on our own, it's filthy. So do you pursue growth by natural or supernatural means? Are you focusing on this outward appearance or are you looking into the heart? Is your obedience a list of checkboxes, things that you do, rituals that you fulfill, things that you strive for, or is your growth a result of a heart being transformed by the Holy Spirit? You compare your standards to God's standards or to other people's 
standards or some standard you put on them. Because the thing is, when we're, when we're looking to God's standard, we just see how we all fall short. And yeah, somebody over here, I may be able to see more of their stuff, but they're no worse off than I am. There is evidence in how we're living legalistically or how we're living by grace and living the gospel. There's evidence of that a lot of times in the ways that we treat other people. Because legalists are naturalists who persecute the faithful. Verse 29. But as as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh, Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. That's Isaac. So it is now also. This tension that we see that's between the Arabs and the Israelis, it's this, this tension that has impacted the whole world for so long, and especially now, that goes back to Genesis 21 and, and even before. You've got the younger brother, Isaac, who is weaned. And so just as kind of tradition there, Abraham throws a big feast for him. And so they're having this big feast for Isaac, but Ishmael comes in and he mocks him, or as Paul translates it here, Ishmael persecutes him. As the older brother, yes, his mother is a slave, but he's still got Abraham over here. He's assuming that as the older brother, in the way that custom, tradition, all that goes, he's going to get a double portion of the inheritance. So if there were just two kids, and for a time there were, it would be two-thirds go to him, one-third go on over to Isaac. And so he's the big one. He's the one that's going to carry on all of Abraham's estate. And it's supposed to, he thinks, all work through him. And he got a little arrogant, maybe a little entitled, yet the promise was through Isaac. And so God made a way for the inheritance to go to Isaac too. Now, Paul says, bring this forward a little bit. He says, like Ishmael, the Judaizers think the inheritance is theirs. They think that they're on top. The legalists think they're the ones because they are children of natural means, of natural descent. And so as the gospel went to the Gentiles and kind of weaned them off of what they were following before from their old ways, the Judaizers then, the legalists, started to persecute the Christians. But the inheritance goes to the faithful. It goes to the spiritual children of promise, not to the children of natural descent, not the children of works. So here's where we get personal. Let's think about our own experience and just what we see in and around us. From your experience today, who tends to be the most oppressive and shaming and controlling and ostracizing? All of those things, shaming, controlling, oppression, all of that, those those are forms of persecution, and sometimes they come from within the church. It's, it's a means of putting one group above another. And honestly, in my experience, that's, that's what I see from the more legalistic groups. I almost never call it legalism, because we see in Scripture that that's wrong. I remember in college that, and, and I think this happens in most colleges, it happened where, where I went to school, and then later when I was working with the Baptist Collegiate Ministries, we'd see the same thing happening on the campuses we went to, and I hear it from others, but there's these preachers that will go in, center a campus, wherever they're allowed to be, and they will start what they call evangelizing, and it's just shouting at the students who are passing by and, and calling them out for sin. They know nothing about these people, but, and, and saying some pretty horrendous things. And they call that evangelism to some, ex- some extent, yet I have yet to see anyone turn to Christ through that. And I'm sure it's happened at some point, but it mostly just turns people away. The only fruit I have seen from that is when we as, as Christians are, are standing there and have our own table and we happen to be there on the same day, that people who are kind of chastised by these preachers over here come to our table and say, are you like the guy over there? And so it started, I, I've seen that start some great conversations and some relationships even that I had in those years. How many of you, and I'm going to ask, I know, Baptist Church, this is hard to do, get, stretch your arms a little bit because some of you are going to need to raise a hand here, okay? How many of you know someone who has been turned away from Christ and, or, or turned away from the church because of persecution and legalism? You know, like that? That's a whole lot of hands. And then we also got added to that the ones who can't do this, Right? We see that all the time. But let's, let's flip it around a little bit. Let's look at this from, from the other side. If you, so that's like if, you know, the things that we think we're seeing from those that we would call legalists. So 
if you see oppression and shaming and judging and controlling, what does that suggest? Listen, and, and noticing sin, right, that's, that's not a wrong thing. Like we, we see sin sometimes. And, and desiring for a person to be free from sin, desiring for people to live holy and pure lives, that doesn't mean that you're legalistic, okay? The Great Commission says that a part of making disciples is teaching them to obey all that Christ commanded. That, that's a part of what we do. That doesn't make you legalistic because you're, you're pointing people to the joy that is in following Christ. So how do we know the difference? A lot of it has to do with the motivation or, or the focus of, of why you would notice this sin in somebody, kind of the basis that you're using. Is it, is it the Bible or is it your own personal convictions? Let's look at a few signs of persecution and, and legalism versus the signs of a gracious person. And we'll just kind of say when you disagree on something or maybe when you notice sin. For the legalist, you would probably tend toward complaining and criticizing and ostracizing. That's the reason that you see do not complain and do not criticize as part of our tongue assignment last week. It's to help us see some of these things. The gracious person, when they see somebody in sin or possibly in sin, they're going to pray for the person. And not in a way of, oh, Lord, thank you that I'm not like this person, but praying truly for that person. They might confront them as well. If the Lord leads them to that, they would confront them. But do it with an open heart, realizing I may not know that person's entire story. I may have misread the situation. I may not have the right perspective. Also knowing I struggle too, and it may be that I'm just as messed up in that same area and I haven't realized it. But also going to them in love. Not putting myself above somebody else, but just saying, let's grow together. The legalist looks at the surface clothing, outward actions, and they compare that to their own personal standard, which we're not talking about things that come directly from Scripture. The gracious person looks at the heart. They look at the underlying action. And they offer grace knowing that they don't have the full, complete perspective because I'm not walking in your shoes. Legalist, it's a narrow standard that is based on our own personal, maybe, interpretation or more often extrapolation, where we're kind of taking the Bible and kind of pulling things out of it that aren't necessarily there. We base on those things or, or some kind of wrong application of the Bible or something that maybe even the Holy Spirit has laid on our hearts for our lives, but we can't go and put that on somebody else. The gracious person doesn't force their personal convictions on others. The legalist judges the standards as higher and lower. And typically would say the more standards you have, the better you are. The gracious person understands that all people have different struggles. And even if some of those struggles are more obvious than others might be, we can't judge on those things. The legalist will also tend to ignore their own personal struggles. Maybe they'll ignore them, or maybe, with, depending on just kind of how they view themselves, they may be overwhelmed by their personal struggles and just live in shame and fear and guilt all of the time. Sometimes on this end of maybe ignoring your own, your own struggles, you hear a pastor come in and just rail on certain sins that, that are obvious and you see in others, yet you find out that in his own personal life there are things that he struggles with that he would never mention from the pulpit. Because those are okay, because those are his pet sins. Grace is teachable. It is firm, as we are gracious people, we are firm in our acceptance by God, from God, by Christ. And so we are free to admit our sin and to be able to grow. Because yes, I struggle in this way, you struggle in another way. But we are all moving toward Christ and moving toward holiness and purity together. So in case we're not all convicted enough with this whole thing already, I want us to consider some modern examples of ways that we struggle that yet we probably would rarely even notice. Sometimes we believe in our hearts and may even say it out loud that the more you participate at church, the better you are. Right, me here as a guy who wants everybody participating in all kinds of things, sometimes we judge people like this. We got Sunday school, we got our grace groups, we've got crossroads and so on and so on. And so sometimes we say the more of those things that you're doing, we, we judge you as more qualified as a Christian. 
But the thing is, we don't know everything that's going on in everybody's life and in all of your hearts and just how the Lord is using you and guiding you. We don't have a perfect perspective. What if somebody just comes in on a Wednesday night and they drop their kids off at Awana and leave? We may make some assumptions about what they're going out and doing. We would love for them to get plugged into some of the ministries that are happening here. But how do we know that they're not actually walking out the door, unless we ask, to go and, and mentor somebody? Or maybe they're in some kind of group where they're, they're reaching out to people and they're spreading the gospel. Or maybe that's the only night they have free because every other night they're at some organization serving, serving people and, and spreading the gospel in those ways can't judge because we don't always know these things. Should you be serving in your church? Yes, absolutely. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells us so. It also tells us that we are given spiritual gifts strictly for that purpose. So yes, you should be serving here. If this is your home church, you should find a way to serve and to help others to grow. You're gifted for that purpose. Honestly, I get frustrated sometimes, and I have been recently, because we've had trouble getting people to step up in Sunday school classes and grace groups where we're wanting to have gather leaders just to kind of do some fellowship things together and some go leaders that will care for our missionaries and help us with that. And we've had struggle, tr struggles bringing those people together. We've taken a little bit of flack because we're asking Sunday schools to take care of the property and to help with some of those things. And so that personally gets frustrating for me, but I also know that we have a lot of people who are serving really well here, and some who might even be overdoing it in ways. This is a busy, busy church, and there are probably more people, just as a percentage, there are probably more people serving within this body than you see in most churches. It's absolutely incredible. And so we have to have that perspective. We have to know that we don't know everything that's going on in lives. We don't judge people by these things. Now, will Sunday school and grace groups and crossroads, are those great ways to serve? Are they going to help you to serve? Are they going to help you to grow? Absolutely. If you, if you participate in those things and, and serve in different ways, is that going to benefit other Christians and help us to reach non-believers? Absolutely it is. But that doesn't mean you have to do everything to be the best Christian. And it also means that we can't start judging people on these things. Because the last I saw, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically how to do all of that. Our deacon training last week, it was, uh, I guess, eight days ago, there was a speaker, and this is just something that I, it just kind of rolls around in my head, and I've had some conversations about, but the, the main speaker there was talking about holding the deacons at his churches, so where he has led these churches, he talks about holding the deacons to a higher standard, and was somewhat recommending that, but letting people kind of choose it for their own churches. And, and that term, higher standards, that's one that I mentioned earlier even in this message. And, and so for him, I, I get what he's saying, that, that we want spiritually mature people leading. <clears throat> I see the logic behind what he was saying, but some of the application of it I struggled with. Because it, it's hard for me to add any requirements to the, to the Bible, to add things to what God says in his word, the things that... He doesn't say. And we are all, I mean, all of us here, we are all expected to live by this biblical standard. This, this is what God gives us. Remember, we're, we're called to obey this as part of growing as disciples. The Bible tells us as well that the leaders of the church, it even talks about elders and deacons, that here's a list of things that, they, that you should see evident in their lives if they're going to serve in those roles. The Bible tells us that not many should presume to be teachers because there is an extra judgment there. But it doesn't mean that there's an extra standard on those of us who would teach or lead a church. It's simply saying that we are called to, like we have to be sure that if somebody's gonna be in those positions, they have to meet those standards. And it's the same things that's there for all of us. And if we say that there's some kind of extra standard that we determine is higher, then what is that saying about the people who don't follow that standard? If one is higher, the other has to be lower. And we've just made a judgment that one is better than the other. We talked a little bit last week in our grace groups, it was all of our grace groups if you're on the same schedule, that, about how the way that we view unbelievers impacts them the way that we view unbelievers, the way that we treat them, the way that we live? Do we think about them just as these horrible sinners that we're afraid of or that are constantly our enemies, or do we love them and try to bring them into the gospel? 
And too often I think that Christians jump to criticism or, or almost sometimes hatred of particular sinful groups. We sometimes get a little judgy, right? I mean, none of you here, we wouldn't, none of you guys. It's only churches down the street, right? Yeah. Practicing homosexuality is a sin. It's really clear in Scripture. But it doesn't mean that people who practice homosexuality are beyond salvation. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't love them. Abortion is beyond horrendous. But it doesn't mean that we can be hateful to somebody who disagrees. We don't hold them to the standard that they don't believe. Yes, I mean, it's it's a standard. It applies to everybody. It's not like it doesn't matter for them because they don't know it. But a part of the disciple-making process is teaching people the truth, is showing them where they err, where they've gone wrong, and bringing them into this joyful way of living, the way that God has created us to live. So in what ways might you be persecuting or shaming others? Because God takes it pretty seriously. Legalists are naturalists who persecute the faithful and will be rejected. Verses 30 and 31. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free woman. Because of persecution, Sarah had Abraham send Hagar and Ishmael away. They were cut off from the family. They were rejected. So Paul says in the same way, the Judaizers, the legalists, they have no inheritance. They they are to be cut off from the family. They have cut themselves off even from God. And we're not talking about losing your salvation here. He's not referring to like every time we struggle with legalism, oh my goodness, I just... I just had a legalistic thought, I'm out, right? That's, that's not what we're, what we're dealing with here. This has more to do with your means of salvation. Are you saved by grace through faith, by Jesus Christ, or are you saved by your works? Even though we saw earlier in Galatians when Paul confronted Peter, we saw very clearly that your actions can be legalistic even if you believe the right things. Right? They can fall into that legalistic category, but yet we're still, we're secure in Christ and And even our legalistic actions and thoughts and those kind of struggles can be forgiven. But we don't want to wallow in it. We don't want to accept that as a lifestyle for ourselves any more than we would any other sin, right? We we don't want to accept and just let all this sin come into us. We, We want to fight those things and see those things gone. And so the Galatian readers, as they're hearing Paul kind of spinning this this allegory here, they're catching on right away that Paul is saying they have to cast out the Judaizers. They've got to cast out the legalists from among their midst. And if that's what they were supposed to do, what are we supposed to do? What should we do about legalism? What should we do about legalists? And I would say the same thing. They are to be cast out. They are to be, and stick with me on this. This would be a terrible time to leave the message. All right, we've got to finish this. They're to be excommunicated. Now, that's a big deal. Does that mean, though, that every time that someone seems legalistic, that we kick them out of the church? Or even that that somebody does something or says something or thinks something that is legalistic, that boom, we kick you out? No, absolutely not. Of course not. We're, We're talking about here persistent, unrepentant legalism. And so you treat it like any other sin, right? Because anyone in here sinned this week? I now I know your hands aren't working. Or, or you're really prideful, and then, well, there's your sin right there, right? We all have these sins that we struggle with, and if, if those are persistent things that we are unrepentant of, then we follow the same kind of pattern. We don't, like, go and just excommunicate every time we sin. That's kind of legalistic. If they're not pushing their standard on other people, but maybe lacking their own freedom then we treat them to a degree like, like a weaker brother. That's, that's what you do. And it's possible, and I would say often likely, that maybe somebody's got a particular conviction that the Holy Spirit has given them that conviction for some purpose, maybe to reach a certain group of people or, or whatever. And so that's fine, that the Lord has given them that. And, and so we're even told in Scripture that if we see somebody who has this kind of 
extra biblical standard of some kind that I will limit my freedom so that I don't cause you to stumble away from what God has called you to do or what you feel in your conscience that God has called you to do as long as it aligns with scripture. All right, so that's not the kind of thing we're talking about. But it's when they start pushing that on others or treating people in these legalistic ways or persecuting people. And so if we recognize or suspect an issue of legalism with someone or any sin, we approach them in love and we approach them in humility knowing that I struggle too. That's the purpose of the video there is to show us some things that we all struggle with. And so if I'm going to go to you and say, hey, I think you're treating this person a little bit oppressively. I think there's some legalism involved here. I've got to recognize that I've got those issues myself and I've got to be willing to deal with those. And so we approach them in love and humility knowing that we struggle. And if they're teachable and they want to change, then you have just grown closer. You have, you have won yourself a brother or sister. If they're not, then you go back with a witness and you have the conversation again. And if there's still nothing or you haven't realized that you were wrong, if there's still nothing there, if there's no repentance, no, no change there, then you take them to the church leaders. That's what scripture lays out for us with any sin. And if they're still unrepentant, unwilling to change, we can't allow them to represent the church. We can't stand there and say, I, I agree, I, I am certain that this person is a believer. And so we cast them out from the body. Not in a way to say, okay, we want nothing to do with you, we don't like you, or, or to judge them. But in order that we would want them to desire to come back. And that's what you're trying to do is to, to win them back. And so that's why you treat them as an unbeliever. Like We don't shun unbelievers. We go to them when we try to bring them in. Is it really that important that, that we would treat it even like sin? Absolutely it is. The gospel is at stake in dealing with legalism. And what do we just say about how living the gospel impacts other people? So how will you defend others from oppressive legalism. And you got to be really careful here because we don't want to become legalistic about not being legalistic, right? We've still got to be compassionate. We've still got to be forgiving. We've got to be gracious. We've got to give people the benefit of the doubt that we don't know everything that's happening there. Or you know what? It's possible that something that you think is legalistic in their life is actually something the Bible says and you just didn't know it. That's a possibility too. So we're gracious. We give them the benefit of the doubt or the benefit of grace. Maybe we assume that it was accidental and we want to teach people rather than chastising people. And so as we look at these questions that we're talking about today, do you pursue growth by natural or supernatural means? That list of rules and actions and standards or our heart faith that is yielded to the Holy Spirit to be transformed to the inside out? In what ways might you be persecuting or shaming others, even if it's unintentional or subconscious? As we just asked, how will you defend others from oppressive legalism? Because it may be that you're defending others from yourself. All of that, as we look at that together, it helps us to understand that question that we ask every week. Are you living the gospel? And so here's my challenge to you for this week. I want you to take some time this week. You can do it on your own. You can do it with others. This could be a fun family exercise, grace group, or, or just whoever. But I want you to compile a list to describe, kind of paint a picture of the perfect Christian life. How would a normal day go? What's their physical appearance? What about what kind of relationships would they have? What kind of habits would they have? What kind of habits would they not have? Just anything you can think of. And try to make this list early in the week, maybe even today before you come back for the, the joint grace group, what we're calling the big gig here tonight. Do it early in the week, and then as you're going through the week, you can start adding other stuff as you think about it. And keep the list for at least 10 days, and even bring it back here next week. You might be catching on to what I'm doing to you. It's okay, do it anyway. As we talk about legalism, as we talk about judgment and shaming and oppressing others, that can bring up all kinds of emotions for us. Because we in this building, we, we're coming from all different backgrounds and, and different struggles in life. Some of us are, are hurt. And, and then there's other, others of us that, that are also convicted because we're realizing that, man, I've hurt other people in the way that I've treated them in legalistic ways. There's some of us here too that we have been struggling with guilt and oppression coming from others or even coming 
from ourselves and maybe we're just starting to feel relief for the first time or just saying, I need to feel this relief of the gospel of grace, of freedom. I need to be freed from this oppression. And there's probably some here too that, man, when you heard the gospel, it didn't sound like a good thing. You didn't realize the freedom that we, that we have in Christ and the gospel and how freeing it is, how freeing Christianity is. And, and so maybe now that you hear that truth about it, it's something you're interested in learning more about. So whatever you may be dealing with, we as a church, we, we want to help you. So as we sing here in just a second, we're going to have some pastors out in the foyer just there to, to talk with you or pray with you, listen, whatever you need. If that's not something you want to do, you can grab the, the information card, the plug-in card out of your bulletin, and you can just write something on there, put your contact information on there. We've got the drop boxes on the info booth right outside of these doors here. Put it in there. We'll contact you this week, but whatever. We just, you can contact the office on your own because I think the phones are working today, which is a good thing. So we, we want to connect with you and help you to walk in grace and find this freedom and the joy that comes with it. You just got to let us know how we can do that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for grace. Yes, this church, but even more, the concept that we can, by your grace, live your gospel. So God, I pray that you would free us. I know you have set us free. I pray that we would learn that freedom and walk in that freedom. God, set us free and, and keep us from oppressing or enslaving others in any way. Convict us, change us by your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Stand and sing together. Pastors will be in the back to talk with you and pray with you.
couple weeks ago, but we were trying to find a way to make uh, Grace on the Go a little more effective, and I really blew it this morning, but it's going to be now. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you know this, but behind the scenes, we have three or four people that actually video these 